Good morning and welcome to this session of the WIOA webinars. Welcome to today's WIOA Unified State Plan Public Comment Period webinar. My name is Scott Shook. I'm with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. As a reminder, all participants on the call are in mute mode. Please enter any questions that you have for the facilitators in the question box. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Baker, who will be uh, assisting with the presentation. Thank you, Scott. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is our um, kind of last hurrah of interaction with the public prior to uh, the end of the public comment period. So we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your interest and also give you an overview of uh, the state plan and how it, was, how it was pulled together and who was involved. And then an overview of our strategies and activities that we'd like to highlight and then give anybody the opportunity uh, if they wish to ask any questions, any clarifying questions you might have over what our intent was about any particular section of the plan or if there's something in the plan that you didn't understand or you wanted us to clarify, you we're here today to, to take care of that. Uh, and then uh, the public comment period is open until February 9th. We will have the, the mailbox address um, later in the, in the webinar available uh, as a reminder, uh, but it is on Illinois WorkNet. Those of you familiar with the Illinois WorkNet website, on the state plan page, you will find the web address there and instructions on how to submit your formal public comment. So today we are joined by Cameron Sweatman from KEB. He'll be handling the first part of the webinar, which is an overview of the state plan um, content. Then we, following that, we will go into a deeper dive into the strategies and activities, and that'll be handled by me representing Title I. Uh, representing Title II, we have LaVon Nelson from the Illinois Community College Board. Title III, Wagner Pizer is represented by Todd Lowry from the Illinois Department of Employment Security. And Title IV is represented by John Marchioro from the Illinois Department of Human Services Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. So with that, I uh, will turn it over to Cameron and we will get underway. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, I, my name is Cameron Sweatman uh, with KEB. I help facilitate the Unified State Plan uh, development and uh, submission process and other WIO activities throughout the program year. Uh, just to give us a, a quick overview of today's agenda, uh, we'll start off with our presentation on uh, WIOA and the Unified State Plan, how they fit together. Uh, we will review the state strategies um, and, and get some uh, core partner um, input on those, and then also uh, uh, have some time uh, for uh, uh, questions, clarifying questions as well. So uh, first, though, I want to go over some key workforce-related plans that are related to uh, these planning efforts that are related to uh, the economic development and workforce development uh, in the state. Uh, first, we have the five-year uh, economic development plan, uh, which includes the governor's vision for economic prosperity in the state, um, with many elements that are related to, directly to uh, education and, and to workforce. And that's developed by the Department of Commerce. And then we also have the WIOA Unified State Plan, which is the, the four years state strategy for workforce development and the, the workforce system in the state uh, developed by the State Workforce Board or in Illinois, the Illinois Workforce Innovation Board or the IWIP. Um, and then also the WIOA Core Partners, uh, which we have represented today, as Mike mentioned. Uh, and then we also have the Perkins Five Career Technical Education Plan, which is developed by the Community College Board. Uh, and, and the State Board of Education that uh, really deals with the strategies for developing more fully uh, academic, career, and, and technical skills for uh, secondary and post-secondary students. Uh, and then we also have the Adult Education and Workforce Education Strategic Plans. Those are developed by uh, the Community College Board, uh, Commerce, and other stakeholders. With the Workforce uh, Education Strategic Plan, uh, focusing on addressing skills gaps and uh, also improving career-related education in the state. And the adult education strategic plan focusing on aligning activities with workforce to move individuals into those uh, in demand uh, career pathways. So, uh, all of these plans share the same goal of improving community uh, prosperity and the state's competitive position 
in, in the country. Um, but underneath these overarching goals, there are different uh, contexts and focuses of these plans as well. Uh, to give you an example of, of a difference, we have the BO Unified State Plan, the Perkins 5 uh, plans, they're federally mandated, while, for example, the five-year economic development plan is state mandated, just to give you an example of, of the differences there. Uh, but before we get too far into the Unified State Plan, I do want to go over uh, the principles of WIOA, which the Unified State Plan obviously functions within. Uh, so WIOA prioritizes collaboration and alignment between employment, education, and training programs. So just as we want to see alignment amongst our strategic planning efforts, there's alignment is also a, a major uh, tenet of WIOA itself. Uh, we have program alignment, creating employer-driven uh, training solutions, making sure that our workforce is getting provided the skills uh, and resources they need in order to uh, to have to ex exhibit and use those skills when they get a job in a high demand career. And then we also have uh, increased accountability, uh, establishing common performance measures. So no matter where you are throughout the state, we're using the same performance measures, uh, increasing transparency uh, with reporting, and then also enhanced service delivery uh, expanding career pathways through public-private uh, partnerships for all populations, including those with multiple barriers to employment and underserved populations, and focusing training, again, on those skills that businesses actually need. Uh, so I do also want to go over the WIO Core Partners in Illinois again, just to mention that they are heavily involved in, in the creation of the Unified State Plan and its development. They, uh, the Core Partners respond to actual program-specific uh, requirements in the plan. Um, and are also uh, heavily involved in the implementation of WIOA along with the state board and uh, other required and situational partners across the state as well. But where do these core partners exactly fit into the WIOA system? I do want to go over, over that uh, as well. We have the governor, which of course the ultimate authority within the WIOA system lies with the governor. And then uh, under the governor, we have the state workforce innovation board. They provide strategic leadership and, and oversight and guidance uh, that will further the state's goals to meet the workforce needs of businesses and workers. And then we also have the WIO interagency leadership team and uh, technical assistance teams. Uh, the leadership team, they help the seven state agencies collaborate to ensure that WIO regulations and policies are being implemented correctly at the local level. And the interagency technical assistance team, they provide that technical assistance uh, to required partners and local areas really operationalizing policy and guidance uh, to resolve, resolve those local implementation issues uh, with more of a direct intervention if needed and also uh, support. And then we come to the four core program partners um, and other required partners. Within RIOA, they actually provide the services on the ground to those job seekers in the local areas, as you can see uh, represented in those uh, red ovals there. Uh, each of these local areas has to house at least one comprehensive one-stop center, uh, a one-stop shop, if you will, uh, for getting the, these WIOA services, uh, as you can see on that map to the right there. Uh, and within uh, the map, you also see uh, the red shaded areas, uh, the red outlined areas, I should say, and those are the 10 economic development regions that house the local areas. And so when we talk about regional planning and regionalism, uh, we, we are referencing the, these economic development regions that house these local areas as well. Okay, so now that we've reviewed Rio a little, maybe now we can go and actually see exactly where the Unified State Plan fits in the Rio implementation system for 2020. So the Illinois Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Unified State Plan, I say it like that just to again reiterate that Unified State Plan is part of, of WIOA. It provides a vision of the governor's integration of workforce, education, and economic development policy and programs for the state. You're going to see this uh, idea of integration of workforce, education, and economic development a lot today. As, of course, it's, a, it's a, again, a main tenant of WIOA. And then uh, also, I do want to mention that the Unified State Plan serves as a federal compliance document for uh, the United States Department of Labor and Education as well. So we'll be turning in the or submitting the Unified State Plan through the federal portal uh, in March. Okay, so I do want to go over the Unified State Plan uh, vision, principles, and goals as well, just to get a basis for an understanding of the Unified State Plan before we get into more of the meat of it. Um, so first, I'll just read what's on the screen here while you read it along with me. Uh, promoting business-driven 
talent solutions that integrate education, workforce, and economic development resources across systems to provide businesses, individuals, and communities with the opportunity to prosper and contribute to growing the state's economy. So what do these words actually mean? I think it's important that we actually uh, kind of walk through them. So promoting business-driven talent solutions, uh, this has to do with ensuring the state has a prepared workforce ready to meet our business needs, as we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, it, uh, that integrate education, workforce, and economic development, this idea of integration, uh, this pertains to coordinated service delivery between core and required partners, and the integration and sharing of data. And then uh, in regards to resources across systems, uh, we want to coordinate and integrate across strategic plans, across service delivery methods, and uh, share strategies and resources to provide better services. Uh, in regard uh, to businesses, individuals, and communities, uh, giving them the opportunity to prosper and contribute. If we, beat the, if we meet the business community's workforce needs by preparing individuals to meet, to meet those needs, we can uh, help all communities prosper. It's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship, so I'm trying to get at there. So moving on, so the unified state uh, plan principles that are informed by the vision and which themselves inform the goal, it's kind of the, that middle part, part there. Uh, we have eight of those on your screen. One being a demand-driven orientation, uh, strong partnerships with businesses uh, at all levels. Also, a main idea of uh, pathways to careers of, uh, for today and tomorrow uh, for all populations. Uh, Cross-agency collaboration and connections, getting at the idea, again, of, of integration and, and sharing information and being less siloed. Uh, integrated service delivery. Uh, equitable access and opportunity for all populations, uh, clear metrics for progress and success, those common performance measures, uh, focus on continuous improvement and innovation, looking for those best practices as well. So uh, now what are the three unified state plan key goals which are informed by these, these principles? Uh, so goal one, we have uh, unite workforce uh, development partners around regional cluster strategies. Uh, essentially, we want to ensure that the highest potential industries for a given region are those that we focus on in uh, strategic planning efforts and decision making. Uh, goal two, preparing Illinois workers for a career, not just their next job. We want to develop the skills of workers to prepare them for those high demand careers again uh, by developing their skills for now um, and for uh, on into the future. And then also connecting job seekers with employers. We want to be that connective tissue uh, between uh, workforce and, and those businesses. Okay, so what are the state strategies to achieve these goals? This is kind of the crux of uh, today's uh, presentation and also what the core partners are also going to talk about. Uh, there are six essential state strategies that underpin Illinois' commitment to engage and support all parts of our education, workforce, and economic development system. So I'm going through these strategies now and we'll go through them a little bit, in a little bit more detail here in a minute. The strategy one, coordinating demand-driven strategic planning at the state uh, and regional levels. So uh, just to summarize this one, there's a process of developing and operationalizing uh, this strategy is built on current state and regional planning initiatives already taking place. Uh, we've developed and are continuously updating our strategic indicators, planning data resources uh, that, we've, that we're actually providing to regional planning uh, teams, some of you may know, uh, to kind of use demand and data uh, data to drive workforce planning and decision making. Uh, so moving on to strategy two, uh, this really concerns promoting regionalism. Uh, again, it's to support employer-driven regional sector initiatives, uh, also concerns aligning resources and strategies at both the local, regional, and the state levels. Uh, strategy three, uh, provide, providing economic advancement for all populations through career uh, pathways. This focuses on aligning the state's education systems, a framework uh, and model strategies have been instituted to assist individuals with uh, multiple barriers to employment and also uh, uh, underserved populations as well. And then we have strategy for expanding service integration, and this pertains to uh, integrated and enhanced career services as well as case management services as well. Um, and I want to mention that a service integration self-assessment as of 2019 has also been instituted that shapes uh, local action plans for uh, local improvement as well in regard to service integration. Uh, strategy five, promoting improved uh, data-driven decision-making. Uh, this concerns using the public-private data infrastructure 
at the state's uh, disposal just to provide employers and job seekers with those tools they need um, to promote and then also access uh, job openings. And then finally, strategy six, uh, this has everything to do with uh, just using the data we have, uh, you know, longitudinal data or low, uh, labor market information uh, to support these other uh, five strategies uh, as well. So we're going to be coming back to these here in a minute, but uh, to talk about how they're operationalized uh, too. But first, I do want to get into the federal requirements of the Unified State Plan. Uh, again, just to kind of uh, buffer uh, our understanding as well. So there is a, a executive summary uh, that is included that really gets into the uh, plan uh, vision, uh, principles, and goals, and then also just a brief summary of the plan. And then we get into the strategic elements, operational elements, and uh, program-specific plans. So again, the strategic elements, they analyze the current economic environment, essentially, and identify the state's overall vision for uh, its workforce development system. And then we have the operational elements, which is, you might have guessed, operationalize or support the state strategies and the vision for the workforce system. And then we come finally to the program-specific plans. Uh, this is where uh, the core partners uh, must address program-specific requirements in the plan as well. And so these are included as an addendum to the Unified State Plan. And this is, again, for the four core partners. Okay, so now I'd like to review the uh, strategic elements uh, and at least touch on uh, each uh, facet of them. So again, uh, the strategic elements essentially uh, are analysis of the state's uh, economic conditions, workforce characteristics, and uh, workforce development activities. Uh, so first we come to the economic analysis. It consists of uh, an uh, analyses of existing demand industry sectors, uh, emerging demand industry sectors and, and employers employment needs. Uh, we include data on uh, emerging, leading uh, and maturing industries uh, by region, uh, emerging uh, industries being those that are not concentrated in a region but are, are expected to grow. Uh, those that are maturing aren't really expected to grow but are still important. Uh, and then we also have the leading industry sectors which are concentrated in the area and are expected to grow as well. Uh, just to give you an example. So then we also have uh, analysis of the current workforce in Illinois, uh, which shows in part that we are providing education training to meet uh, the demands of businesses, and we're adept at adjusting to priorities and service strategies to kind of anticipate labor market trends and changes as well. Uh, then we come to uh, the skills gaps, so the elements that also address skills gaps as well to ensure that we're uh, meeting employer demands, uh, using activities, uh, and strategies. Uh, this would include uh, the increased apprenticeship opportunities that have increased over the past few years in Illinois too under WIOA. And then following, uh, we have the vision principles and goals, and then the six uh, state strategies that we've already gone over that really underpin the state's commitment to engage and support all parts, again, of our education, workforce, and economic development system. Okay, so now we come to the operational elements, which again operationalize uh, those strategic elements and support uh, the state's vision for the workforce uh, system. So I'll go through uh, each one uh, briefly now. So the state board functions, this uh, discusses how the state board is operationalized through its task forces, committees, and subgroups that are focused on uh, certain issues uh, such as service integration or maybe targeting career pathways, for example. And then we come to the implementation of the state strategy. Um, this really discusses the activation or the operationalization of the state strategies as well, which again will be a main focus of uh, today's conversation after, my, after the presentation. And then we also have the state operating systems and policies uh, that will support the implementation of the state strategies, uh, examples being labor market information systems, data systems, uh, communication systems, et cetera. And then we come to the assessment and evaluation of a program and one-stop program partners. Uh, the main idea here is just that we're continue, continuously assessing uh, performance outcomes of the workforce system in annual uh, performance and benchmark reports. And then we have, there's also a discussion of uh, distribution of funds uh, by core program as well, in accordance with the federal law. And then also program data, how we plan to align and integrate data and data systems so we can enhance the coordination of WIOA programs, uh, priority of service for veterans, as well uh, discussing uh, those individualized career services that are being provided and also workshops uh, from specialists. And then also uh, finally addressing accessibility 
of the one-stop delivery system, both for individuals with disabilities and for individuals who are English language learners, making sure that they have those resources they need um, and also staff have the resources they need uh, to ensure there's programmatic and physical accessibility for these populations. Okay, so now we're back to the state strategies which are uh, operationalized uh, in, in this uh, operational elements uh, section. So we're gonna go through uh, each one here. I believe uh, Mike Baker can take us through in more detail, kind of one by one, uh, each strategy and the activities therein. And then also the, the, some of the core partner representatives here today can also uh, chime in uh, as well. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, first of all, I want to ver verify, uh, LeVon Nelson, are you on the phone? Okay, now, um, we'll need to unmute LaVon's phone if she's on, uh, so she has the opportunity to provide input. Okay, uh, thank you, Cameron. Um, we'll do a quick overview of the um, strategies, a little bit of the deeper dive than Cameron covered so far, and some of the activities identified associated with each strategy. And um, the core partners that are gathered on uh, the call will be providing their perspective from their program on, on these that are um, most relevant uh, as we go through. So strategy one is to coordinate a demand-driven planning at the state and regional level. Uh, fortunately, uh, we are kind of in at the culmination of the state planning piece of that. And I'm guessing almost all of you that are on the webinar are uh, reaching the culmination of your regional and local planning process. So that one is pretty much uh, in hand. So uh, kudos to uh, the state of Illinois and everyone working on these that uh, you know, this one's pretty much in the back. So moving forward to strategy two, which is related to supporting employer-driven regional sector initiatives. This is really a continuation of the sector strategies approach that has been you know, um, adopted by the state of Illinois for over a decade. Uh, really no, nothing new earth shattering or um, you know, new here other than a recommitment to the principles of sector strategies and working um, on a regional basis. You know, e economies are regional um, and it behooves us to, to think regionally um, when we're talking economic and workforce development. And also it behooves us to think about working with different sectors of the economy as their own group. You know, each sector, you know, whether it be manufacturing or transportation, distribution, logistics, um, hospitality, tourism, you know, those things, uh, each employers in each of those sectors and workers in each of those sectors have some challenges that are common across all of them, but they have many challenges that are unique to that sector. So the idea here is that we embrace and explore innovative practices on a sector basis, dealing with um, you know, businesses and industry associations and groups that are involved in representing those sectors. Uh, the framework for sector strategies and sector partnerships was part of the state plan in 2016 and 2018, and will be uh, again for this plan. If anyone would like to review it, if you haven't looked at it in a while, uh, you can go to Illinois WorkNet at illinoisworknet.com slash WIOA, and you can find it either as an attachment to the current state plan, or if you look in the menu under business leadership, there is a link or a, uh, a category under that menu that takes you to a sector strategies landing page for anyone that might be on the webinar that would like to learn more about that. Um, one of the things that we are enveloping or including in that is um, the promotion of the talent pipeline management principles, uh, the initiative that was the brainchild of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. They um, you know, that is a particular type of sector strategy and is one that uh, there are six core principles that we'll go, to, go into a little bit later, but you know, that has been embedded into 
several facets of activities that we're working on here, and uh, we'll you know, be speaking to that uh, as we go along. And then also uh, in Activity 2.2, and I'm looking at a handout that was distributed to people that registered for the webinar. So I'm looking in Activity 2, or uh, Strategy 2, Activity 2.2, and that is promoting sector-based business services and employer initiatives. And again, you know, that's working with businesses and business groups to develop tools, to develop information, um, to work with them, uh, with businesses that have similar opportunities, have similar challenges, uh, to do things that are most effective in preparing workers to have the right skills that businesses need to be competitive in the global economy. So that's kind of the Title I perspective on Strategy 2. Do any of the other core partners have any uh, thoughts or input from their program perspective they would like to add to that? Okay. Um, so this is John Marchero. I'm um, the Title IV representative um, and what others may know as vocational rehabilitation. Um, and I, you know, as it relates to this area under Strategy 2, um, you know, vocational rehabilitation is really in, an, in a unique situation where um, our focus really has always been on the dual customer. Um, we have in, we have qualified rehabilitation counselors who focus in one to one with the individual job seeker to help develop um, career goals that they have in moving forward. But in, in addition to that, we also have to look at what the needs. Um, of the businesses are. And what really helped us to kind of take off over the past 10 to 15 years with that has been the work that we've done at the national level. And part of this is aligning with national strategies that each one of our kind of core areas work with. And the national employment team has been one of those things that has really helped us to focus on and see the value through the eyes of the business and what they need as well. And so one of the things that we've tried to do and stay very focused on is as we really look to build those relationships with business as well, we bring that back and also find out that what may be best for the business could be the services that we can provide through our services, but it could also be something that can be significantly enhanced by the other core agencies that we work with as well. So we're trying to do the best we can with not only understanding what the real needs are, but what agency can best serve, and then start looking at strategies that can really enhance those types of partnerships by all kind of focusing in on um, the best services that we can provide for that. Um, so that's one thing that I think has been real important. And then, um, let's see, under the sector-based services and initiatives, um, we, one of the things that we've done kind of to help to really enhance that, to work more across the lines with our, with our core partners um, and what we do with business, is to establish, again, a business unit that allows us to be able to reach out directly and have individuals that go directly to businesses to really understand um, what their needs are, share that information with different people at different one-stops, who are also doing business services so that we can really start becoming a lot more unified within those services. And what we find is that once we have an engagement with a business, typically they're, if they're going to benefit from us, they see the value in what other um, core partners can do as well. And so it's really been working out well for us to be able to share along the lines with our other core partners what we're finding out with certain businesses. Um, and surely Title III has been, and through Department of Employment Security, has been terrific with that. Um, and we're starting to also branch into some opportunities through adult education as well um, that we really hope to see to, um, to be able to build on and then be able to share with other businesses in those areas as well. This is Todd Lowry. I'm with the Illinois Department of Employment Security. I'm Business Services Manager. I think what we've seen, and we've discussed this strategy several times here over the last week or so in the public comment forums, and what we're seeing, overridingly seeing, is the fact that there seems to be a lack of communication. A lot of folks have spoken to the fact that they coordinate well, 
that they uh, they collaborate well when given the opportunity. And specifically, when we're talking about developing strategies and looking at all the various tools that we have in our toolbox to do that, uh, we need to communicate better. And what we heard, and again, it was a, a little bit overwhelming what we heard, was the fact that there seems to be a lack of that communication piece in the way of, I don't understand what your program does. And I don't understand how your program impacts what I do. Um, we talked uh, a lot about how to engage with businesses in a way that doesn't send several folks from several different core programs and others across their threshold in that single point of contact. In developing our sector strategies, if we're gonna work with employers and we want demand-driven jobs, then we have to talk to the source. Um, I think a flip side of that and not being discussed as often is talking to the workers themselves as well. Uh, when we develop these strategies, how do we know what the perspective of is the worker? I was myself at, uh, at a doctor's appointment and was talking to a medical assistant and I asked him what the opportunities there were to move into the nursing program because that's what he wanted to do and he stated that uh, there was not a bridge program within this particular health institution. I have to know there is. So I thought another, it's not only the communication from the core partners, it's the communication to employers, to their own workers. It's us discussing with them how to develop these strategies in these areas where we have to have these jobs. We have a lack of a career and a talent pipeline built. So the initiatives that are produced here in, this, in the state plan and in these strategies can help us, but we need to take them one at a time and break them down with the partners, have these discussions as open and as often as possible. Um, so that's overriding comments from me. I, I think we just have to ask the question, how do we engage more effectively? And then how do we monitor and provide some accountability for what we are doing statewide? Thank you, Todd. Is anyone from Title II on that would like to make a comment? Um, does anyone that's participating as an attendee on the webinar have any clarifying questions they would like to ask about any of the content we've covered so far? Okay. Well, there will be an opportunity at the end as well. So we'll move on to strategy three. which is provide economic advancement for all populations through career pathways. You know, we're very committed as a state and as programs and as providers to the concept of career pathways. Um, career pathways can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but in general, we're speaking to the concept of preparing individuals not only for their next job, but for upward mobility and um, career development throughout their lifetime. Um, there are several ways to go about that. Um, activity 3.1 is the identifying those leading career pathway models and making them available and, and as many people in Illinois as possible aware of them. Um, you know, coming up with you know, uh, standard definitions so we're all kind of know where everyone is coming from, whether you're coming from a workforce perspective private sector or a different program um, or education perspective, everybody kind of knows what the terminology means and, and understands and avoids communication breakdown when you're using the same term, but it means different things to different people. Uh, also, that involves you know, high quality credentials, industry recognized credentials that tell businesses that people with that credential have vital skills that are value added for their business model and for their competitive position. And also that tells the, the career seekers and job seekers that um, the work they're doing is meaningful in the private sector and is likely to help them advance in their career you know, when they earn that credential. Um, no. If you're following along in the document that we sent out, I'm not going to go through these one by one, um, but I just want to hit the highlights here. Um, you know, activities 3.2 and 3.3, that's making sure that folks who are uh, deficient on either math or reading skills have pathways 
to, to build those skills effectively so that they can enter the workforce or enter training or perhaps both, or, you know, incorporating work-based learning. You know, some of these can be text contextualized, so it's reading for construction or math for construction uh, kind of examples. Um, and then also we want to figure out okay, how can we engage um, populations that maybe have not been fully engaged or uh, perhaps even disenfranchised, you know, out-of-school youth, uh, individuals with disabilities, um, basically anybody that has a barrier to employment that we would like to do a better job of integrating them into the process and getting them the skills they need. Uh, essentially, you know, taking together these two activities, I believe, could be effectively summarized by saying, we want to help individuals reach their full potential, whatever that might be. Um, you, you can't take someone who's starting out at zero skills and turn them into a rocket scientist in a year, but you can help them make steps gradually and you know, really the, the sky is the limit on, on, on each person, but you have to know where their sky is. Um, you know, so basically it's just helping people, you know, get as high as they possibly can get um, based on, on you know, the gifts they have and perhaps the barriers they might have. Um, and then of course, um, activity 3.4 is promoting the use of all types of apprenticeship. Uh, you know, we have registered apprenticeships, um, um, registered through the US Department of Labor, but there are also effective apprenticeship model training that combine work experience with uh, classroom training or hands-on training that allow folks to earn and learn at the same time. And there are other work-based models as well, you know, on-the-job training, kind of worker training, etc. But the idea is that we want to promote that earn and learn model to the fullest extent possible. You know, our research has, has shown that one of the biggest barriers to effectively completing training are for individuals that need to be earning money while they are, you know, in, in that kind of training. Um, you know, it, when your choice comes down to putting food on the table or completing that class, especially if you have children, usually putting food on the table wins. So any way that we can build in work-based learning opportunities so folks have that opportunity to bring some income into, the, into their family and also get effective work-based skill training, then you know, we're all better off. Does anyone have any questions? I'm sorry. Anybody from our core partners, other partners, have any comments or clarifications they would like to put from your program perspective on strategy three? Yeah, I'm going to be quick on this one because I, I think we have an opportunity here that we haven't had in the past, and that is that the unemployment rate is really low. So let's use that to grease the door, grease the hinges on the door that maybe didn't swing open to employment as easily as it has in the past. And in doing that, we can engage in employers again. Uh, when we want to improve these uh, bridge, we have integrated education, uh, the training models that we employ. Let's make sure they work right. Uh, when we engage with the employers, let's make sure they're successful at that and it's not burdensome on them. Um, we definitely want to have the access to the in-demand employment. So if we're developing these programs, we need to target them to that. Uh, so the barriers, in a sense, have been removed for us in employing a lot of these the strategies in expanding uh, and improving these programs. And again, on apprenticeships, if you look down in the in the verbiage on the handout, uh, it, it, it improved exponentially uh, from PY15 to 18, 134 percent to 226 uh, percent. You know, go ahead and take a moment and pat yourself on the back because that's because workforce has applied uh, their skill in getting these employed. So <clears throat> this is John Marquero from Title IV again. I would say that strategy three is something that's crucially important um, to the vocational rehabilitation program in particular. Um, probably our biggest uh, population of individuals that we serve our transition age youth up till age 22. Um, so 
making sure that there are supports in place that are needed um, for our individuals as they're exiting out of high school and so they don't lose uh, track throughout their transition um, with adult services is extremely important to us. Um, and as a result of that, there are several different uh, you know, mechanisms that we have in place through the high schools to be able to help individuals with disabilities as far as transition. One of them is the Secondary Transitional Experience Program, or STEP, um, which is really applying uh, with the school district, working to apply different transition uh, experiences for the individuals with disabilities uh, who we work with so that they can get opportunities with real work. And we do a lot of that with um, employers in the community as well. Um, and some of those lead in, most of those, I think, lead into good career opportunities um, that can happen um, after the individual graduates, but it can definitely give opportunity for the individual to get a better idea what they want to do after high school. We also have something that we've been working on quite a bit called Project Search. And we have different contracts through the state of Illinois um, for project search uh, uh, possibilities where it's really kind of an immersion for about a year for individuals who are in high school to really get embedded into um, a specific work culture. We see that lining up pretty well with some of the sector strategies as far as healthcare, IT, hospitality, um, where the student can um, basically go in and have this internship opportunity that can lead to employment afterwards. And then finally, um, as it was a requirement of WIOA, um, we are to serve more individuals who would be potentially eligible for vocational rehabilitation services. And one of the things that we did in order to provide additional pre-employment transition services was to start something called Fast Track. And Fast Track is something where we are reaching out to our partners who are Centers for Independent Living to provide support and assistance in those five core areas of pre-employment transition services to help bridge individuals who are going through um, transition and needing the assistance so that it's one less way for them to kind of fall off that cliff after they transition out. So I see a lot of great opportunities for us to be working with our different core uh, partners. We have already, especially through Title II, and helping to create the connection between the two um, agencies in particular. So that if they have adult uh, education literacy individuals that could use our services, they can make those referrals over and vice versa. And we do a significant amount of work with post-secondary education and training, much of that also being in non-degree type credential programs as well. So I see this as a real bright spot and a real critical spot um, as we continue to work with our partners within the, the workforce system. Okay. Would anyone from Title II like to speak to this particular strategy? Okay, so moving on to strategy four, the expansion of service integration. I mean, this is the uh, one of the many you know, important themes that we've been dealing with uh, as a system for you know, well over a year now, um, and you know, it's only going to intensify as we go forward. Um, it's one of those things that just it's it's you know it's not only is it the law, but it's it, it's a good idea and it's the right thing to do. Um, so diving into the details here a little bit in Activity 4.1, you know, our goal is to provide coordinated and enhanced career services, and that's helping individuals become better aware of their career opportunities, career exploration type thing, um, figuring out what their, their goals might be. And this is, you know, both of these activities we're gonna to speak to here, you know, really to be fully and completely effective, need to involve case managers and, and career service uh, managers from across the programs. Um, people come into the system at various points, and some people need one program, some people need, you know, maybe up to a dozen of the, of the potential programs that are involved, you know, in, in the workforce family. So the trick is helping that individual have access 
and make an informed decision about their future, but have the system and supports available from all, all the resources that we have available to us that are applicable to that individual um, or business for that matter, as the case may be. Um, so these are kind of very similar, you know, activity 4.1 is focused on career services, activity 4.2 on case management, um, you know, which is, you know, um, you know, working together to make sure that a participant in the program is getting all of those services and making adequate progress toward their goals and, you know, getting that input and feedback and support from a program person in each of the area and setting up those program people to work together effectively to have discussions and, and, and the opportunity to create a plan together. I don't, if you've ever gone to the hospital and you, you're not quite sure what you've got going on, you go from one specialist to another, you find out those doctors aren't talking to one another. And where instances where they do collaborate and are communicating together, then your diagnosis happens much faster, your treatment is you know, more effective. That's kind of the same principle here is that we don't, you know, we want to get past simple referrals, but we got, want to get to, you know, coordinated handoffs where appropriate or coordinated, uh, you know, bringing other folks in to be part of the team that is working with an individual to address whatever issues they may have or barriers they have to employment. Uh, so I don't want to drone on too much about that. I think everyone is committed to those. Um, and uh, it's going to be at the forefront of a lot of our activities going forward. Um, activity 4.3, this is an important one um, from my perspective um, because we need to make sure that the line staff, the supervisors in the field across all the programs have all of the information they need and the awareness they need to do that sort of coordinated and integrated service delivery we've just been talking about. Um, that's basically understanding, um, you know, eliminating artificial barriers. You know, maybe you have a, a uh, if someone has an inadequate understanding of what's available, they may think there's a barrier where one really does not exist. Um, and it's gotta be a continual effort. You know, people come in and out of working as, as field staff. So we've got to move beyond thinking, okay, we provided that training last year, we're good. You know, this has to be a more coordinated and more effective ongoing um, strategy and ongoing effort to make sure that everybody that is responsible for providing services in the field is up to speed on what their, um, their opportunities are, what their programmatic limits might be, and being able to effectively come up with workarounds for those limits where necessary so that services can be provided you know, legally and allow and you know, making sure we're doing things allowable for each of our programs, but also you know, being creative um, to help meet the needs of businesses and job seekers. And then um, basically, you know, we want to um, ensure that that sort of thinking is embedded in all of your regional and local plans and MOUs. So without having to recreate lots of documentation, you know, you all have been working on your service integration self-assessment, you know, this past fall. Um, hopefully at this point you're putting into practice uh, some priorities for making improvements in areas that you have decided are most important to your area. And just as a matter of formality, we built into the planning guidance that we want you to you know, acknowledge that you're going to be implementing you know, whatever it is you come up with locally as part of the strategy uh, going forward in your local area. So with that, I'll turn it over to my partners here and ask if they have any program uh, perspective from their programs they would like to add. Yeah, so we were just, we talked about this yesterday at the Unified State Plan meeting down in Ina. I probably stayed about at least a half an hour afterwards and talk to some people from LWEA 26. And it was kind of along these lines. They were saying, you know, we could really use assistance with figuring out how we can better get some of these um, individuals that we see come in 
uh, through Title II over to you guys, but we're not exactly sure that we know what your eligibility criteria is. And I said, well, you don't always have to be an expert on that, but if we talk about it, <laughs> we know how to make that referral happen. Um, and likewise, we were saying, you know, here's a situation where you guys are telling us you've got two or three different uh, training programs that you're trying to get people into right now, and you can't find the supply. I said, well, what helps us best with our career plan sometimes when we're working directly with our individuals? Knowing what's also available to see if it matches up. So if we know about your different uh, programs that you're wanting to get people into for training and education to get industry-recognized credentials, that helps us to direct our customers as well into some of those areas if they don't have a plan already. So by communicating that back and forth, we're really going to be a lot better off. And so creating the connection, I think, is extremely important um, between the different partners. And I think that that's, that started to lead into a bigger question about not just um, a Title IV and a Title II thing, but really how we can start to work a lot better in some of these teams with things like an integrated resource team. Some people know it as something different, but it's really looking at sometimes these individual cases and going, what would they need from Title I or what could Title I potentially provide? Uh, Title IV may have the case, but do I need to go ahead and make a referral over for employment services as well? So it's always making sure that um, we can really start, I think, through service integration, making sometimes real easy attempts at making this happen by just communicating back and forth. This is what I have. This is what our eligibility criteria is. So don't think that you can't refer over because you've heard that maybe that doesn't meet eligibility criteria. Let's just have the discussions. Let's let's try to work with that. So um, we have, uh, I think that's a huge impact that every core partner can benefit from. Um, but as, as, it talk, I mean, as we talk about kind of aligning those services, I think that's a huge area for for all of us going forward. And I'm going to speak to encapsulating uh, all, all three of these, four of these strategies that are mentioned under uh, expand service integration. Uh, first and foremost, the Illinois Career Information System, which is uh, a DPS uh, platform, can, can work in various ways. And I think you have to, one of the ways that it needs to be employed is to make sure that you understand who the stakeholders are when we're engaging with this system. That could be the parents, that could be counselors, that could be teachers, it could be workforce providers. When you're looking at a system that's gonna tell you what the occupational wages are, uh, what the emerging markets are, what the, what, the, what the prospect is for these jobs of the future, if we're developing a career pathway for someone that's 14 years old, then we wanna to look to the future to see where, they're, where they would like to gain. We have to ask the questions, you know, the student themselves, when they go into this system, you know, what do they want to do? How can you achieve that goal? What, are the, what does the data tell me and how am I informed in that? And what resources are available out there to assist me to get there? So I, I did want to spend a little time on career information systems because I think it's a very valuable tool that all partners can engage with. Um, I do want to reiterate what both John and Mike have said this morning about referrals. I think there's two types of referrals two types that we'd like to employ. The first is an informed referral. Know that that referral that you are making because you are have enough information or cross-trained on programs to send that person to the proper place. Let's not spin wheels. So the other one is informative referral. That person receiving the referral, as much information as possible that's gonna give them the knowledge to move forward with, a, with an actionable plan for this individual. So that's about all I have to say. I, I really think that encompasses uh, all of these strategies in the partner coordination, in the in the enhanced case management. Again, it was brought up uh, at our last public, or both the ones that I attended anyway, uh, information sessions or public comment periods about talking about career management as opposed to case management. I think many times we refer to case management. It, a bit obligatory, it's a bit overriding. And if we talk about career management when we're working with individuals, then hopefully we're pointing them in the direction for long-term employment. That's about all I have. 
type, if they were interested in looking at the CIS system, where would they go to do that? You can type in the keywords Career Information System or Illinois Career Information System. It'll be the first box. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions they would like, or information they would like to clarify? Okay, we're moving on to strategy five then, promoting improved data-driven decision-making. Uh, data-driven or data-informed decision-making has long been a uh, concept we've talked about uh, in Illinois. It goes back to our original work in sector strategies over a decade ago. But you know, it is applicable to things beyond sector strategies. I mean, it's, it really needs to be embedded in, in everything we're doing. Um, um, Debbie Edward Deming has a great quote on this one. Uh, Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Okay. So the idea is that if we can make data more accessible and help turn it into actionable information, the better off we are. So um, the activities uh, in this strategy are all kind of geared toward that end goal. Uh, and activity 5.1, um, we want to help employers and businesses better communicate their needs to us. Uh, there are you know, industry standard models out there. The Talent Pipeline Management Initiative has uh, a template that can be followed by any business or, or any um, program individuals working with businesses to try to help get the data right. I mean, that is one of the, one of the six fundamental tenets in Talent Pipeline Management is get the data right. So that involves primary data from you know, the big sources from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the U.S. Census Bureau, those sorts of things. But it also is data that you gather yourself locally. Um, you know, the data that um, was provided you know, in this plan from those federal sources is as good as it gets. You know, it, it's the most recent available, but there are limits to it, and everyone recognizes them. In order to overcome those limits and have more recent data, we have to gather that ourselves. So it has to be a combination of going after you know, all the data that's out there that is trustworthy and, 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 and reliable, but also augmenting it with our own local knowledge and our own local data gathering. Um, in Activity 5.2, I mean, we're partnering with uh, the Perkins um, staff in, the, in development of the Perkins plan and sharing the data developed for this plan with them and also with staff at the State Board of Education. Um, in the past, uh, relatively recent past, the adult ed um, program worked on the essential skills uh, uh, framework, in, excuse me, essential employability skills framework. Um, basically, that's the list of skills you need to have to succeed in the workplace. Okay? And while that was developed primarily by the adult ed community, with input from others, of course, uh, that framework is applicable to everyone, you know, across all the programs. Um, so that's just something, you know, where we need to leverage a product developed by primarily by one of the partners, you know, with input from others. Um, across our program and, and utilize that to the extent possible. Okay. And then we also want to improve access to the eligible training provider list um, and then use that list and be able to generate data from it to determine you know, which providers are having higher success rates at getting individuals employed, you know, successful completion rates, that sort of thing. So there are a couple things going on in this one. One is helping providers that are providing quality services and quality programs get on that provider list so that their services could be accessed by the programs. But then also, you know, better tracking and better understanding the performance of those providers so that we can identify best practices. But also, if we see a provider that, um, you know, perhaps is lagging performance, Maybe there's a, an opportunity for technical assistance um, to make sure that anybody going into that program has all the advantages of somebody going into one of the programs that might be higher performing. And then lastly, um, and we'll touch on this a little bit in the next strategy, 
but improving access and utilization of labor market and workforce system information. Um, essentially, the goal here is to try to take this massive volume of data that's out there and make it more accessible, more understandable, and more user-friendly. Um, lots of strategies, specific strategies to do that, you know, through the use of dashboards and visualizations, or maybe, you know, GIS, you're looking at things spatially. Uh, but the, the goal here is to, you know, pull the, the pieces together and, and, and look for the patterns, look for the outliers, look for the things that tell us if we're being effective or not, or are we reaching the populations we want to reach? Uh, lots of different approaches to that. This is just a very general strategy or a very general activity to say that we understand the importance of providing information over providing raw data. Anyone else have thoughts on that? I'm going to be pretty brief on this because I think the strategy laid out here is, is really well defined, if I may say so. I, I really think when you go through and you read this information, uh, there's not a whole lot to for us to break down in addition to what you said. Um, one of the things that I did write down as Mike was talking, when we're talking about what the demand competencies are, when we're talking about the quality specific demands and talent, Flow analysis. I think I think sometimes we use a lot of words to to, to say uh, what we mean, and so I, I think there are questions sometimes. And, and so if you have any questions on any of this, uh, feel free to contact any of us to talk or today uh, write your questions in, and we'll we'll get those answered. Um, but a lot of times when we're defining what employers need or a term. It really comes down to justifying our activity with that employer. How do we justify? What's our return on investment? Uh, are we providing additional jobs in the community? Are we providing uh, incumbent worker training and, and we're getting more people hired into the pipeline? Uh, are we doing those things? And then I'm just going to jump to the last strategy on here, which was the improve access utilization of labor market information. It, a lot of times we look, we take this data, we put it in the regional plan, and, and there it sits for the next four years. How often are we going back to that data? And I, I really want to emphasize what Mike said about tracking what we've done and how that correlates, how we connect the dots to what the data tells us. Is our planning based on reality? Is our planning based on specific needs of the employer? So. I think we can do a little better job, all of us, in, in looking at how we can be accountable for what we do. How, let's look at those successes. Let's let's exploit those successes to a point where we're actually building upon that. So that's what I have to say about that. Um, yeah, I don't have uh, a ton. Of, this is John from Title Four. I don't have a, uh, much information on this uh, to, to to really share, but I will say. Um, there's nothing better when you're you're speaking to an employer and um, you're, you're getting into your relationship and establishing it and you're able to share with them um, that these are the different services that we can show data on that have been provided to you and this is how it's resulted in a in outcomes um, to be able to lay that out so it's not just uh, it's it's right there concrete on paper or in a visual and as we you know this has always been one i think that's been a little bit of a challenge as far as it's not going to happen tomorrow but it's going to be much more of the strategic idea as we go as we go down this path that as we really start to be able to lay out to employers not only is this what maybe our work with you has been but as an entire workforce agency this is how we've been able to see that we've been able to interact with you through through different partners as well, and you're very valued to all job seekers um, that may come through the workforce system. I think that that's going to be, I think that's going to speak volumes to a business until so they realize, wow, this is something that we didn't realize because the impact of this. So I think any work that we can do to continue to work through that is going to be is going to be very helpful because let's face it, there's a lot of businesses that don't just work in Illinois. 
And yeah. so for them to be able to share this with their other satellite companies in other states um, and not have to necessarily re um, start over again, but to be able to try to replicate what happened in Illinois with some other areas as well, really works at the bigger strategic picture for the value that the workforce can do for the businesses. And I'm just gonna have a, a, a one more comment here. I, I think a lot of times we're talking about working with this data and we talk almost exclu exclusively today about the four core partners and working together, but we have to consider that we have many more partners out there that are gonna assist this effort. We're working with our local economic development folks, our, our community organization, our chambers. Uh, we can get more involved and we can get a better feeling for what the pulse of an area has. This plan was written as an overriding document, but each area has specific dynamics. And each area, that's what's gotta be figured out at the local and regional levels is what are our specific dynamics. And the use of this labor market information can many times map that out. But I think there's some exciting changes coming in the future as well, working with uh, our WorkNet folks and our DCO partners to even further define targets that are possibly in need of our services a little more quickly. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as that develops. But I, I really think that that's going to be a game changer in identifying what businesses are going to benefit from our activity and our return on investment again is, is, is justifiable. Well, and now that we don't have to, like, there's not that worry anymore of if you refer over to us, you know, only you'll get the outcome. That shared outcomes are there. When we start talking about sharing data with co-enrolled individuals, that's huge as far as being able to see what the real value was, is of working with all the different partners where they need those, where they need those. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, on this strategy? Okay, then moving on to the final strategy six, and, which is advancing the public-private data infrastructure. So this one is closely tied to the prior strategy in that we have some objectives here and, and approaches for building the systems, for utilizing the systems we have more effectively, and essentially, you know, making sure that everybody is, is, is aware of what's out there and using these systems that we have to their fullest capability. Um, we also, uh, as Todd was alluding to, in Activity 6.1, uh, enhancing the labor market information system. One of the things that we've been working on across agencies is, you know, how to build in business intelligence and how can we, you know, maybe be more proactive in dealing with businesses that um, might potentially need our assistance uh, in a coordinated fashion. But then also, you know, that gives us insight into particular um, industries or occupation sets that might, you know, we might be able to do a little predictive analysis on where uh, our services might be needed in, in the coming future or if we have an economic downturn. So, um, you know, more to come on that, you know, you know, this is a four-year plan, so you know, this is kind of a, an outline of where we'd like to go, um, and you know, the work has, has begun on it, but there's still, you know, you know there, there are issues to work through, um, especially, you know, with you know, how to share all of this stuff, but, you know, that is, you know, part of that process. Um, the next one is, you know, expanding the use of the longitudinal data system, which, if that's a new term for anyone, you know, that's tracking, you know, folks, as they go through the entire pipeline, you know, starting in the pre-K all the way through uh, into the workforce and training they get after they enter the workforce so that we can kind of see, you know, patterns and, and see where, you know, we might more effectively apply our resources to uh, address any issues that you know, could be identified. But overall, it's basically, you know, avoiding a fire and forget approach, and it's making sure that, you know, we know the outcomes of the people that, that we are working with and that we set them up for long-term success and we're able to, uh, you know, make sure that they are uh, you know, meeting the goals that, that they set for themselves uh, in working with all of our various case managers and career managers. And then the last one is the one we hear most often is that 
all of this talk about service integration, all of this talk about you know coordinated effort and, and and sharing data would be so much simpler if we had a single system that everybody put all of their information into. Uh, you know, and that is the direction that U.S. Department of Labor and Education are are pushing everyone forward. And frankly, that would be a much easier process if they gave us a bunch of money to do that. But to this point, that has not happened. But that doesn't mean that we're dead in the water. Um, there are ways to effectively utilize the data that we are collecting in our own system and building hooks uh, to each of those programs so that some data may be shared more effectively. So the, the idea here is that while the Holy Grail is a fully integrated, single standalone system that everybody can use harmoniously, we know that it, that's a long way down the road. So the goal here is what can we do to be better at sharing information? What can we do to link our systems or at least utilize information in our systems more effectively across programs to make sure that we understand what's happening with our participants collectively and working you know, toward that more integrated service delivery? Any, any thoughts from anyone else on this one? Well, I'll just say real quick, I, I don't have a, a ton to add, but I do want to make a couple more uh, comments based on the question that you just asked, what can we do? Well, the one thing we can do is communicate. And we found great value um, when we were doing some internal training with our customers on updated job-driven practices within the last couple of years by having the labor market economists through Department of Employment Security invited into our meetings to say, tell us about what you do and how we can work together better. They came in, they provided our staff information on Help Wanted Online, just, just one, one part of all of this. So if we're looking at real tangible things, HWAL helped us to then take information that could be broken into a certain geographic area so that our staff could get together and say, here's who's hiring in this specific area. Let's look at who through career planning that we've done match up with these areas. So even just sharing, you know, Tangible, I think, examples really help in cases like this. So we, we found a lot of value just in that alone. Um, as far as uh, Activity 6-2, I really, really like that idea a lot. Because once again, one of the areas that we've spent so much time uh, really trying to generate more uh, referrals through is our transition age youth. And while this does start earlier, I think it's a way for all workforce agencies to not lose customer and all of this. The more you track, the more you try to have a mapping system for something like this, the more intentional, you know, view or focus is going to be on that individual, which I mean, it leads to less individuals getting lost um, or falling off of that cliff. And we don't want to see that happen. Um, and then I would only say for 6.3, <laughs> I am just very happy that we have finally uh, got somebody hired. Uh, through our system to be able to get information from the different agencies and then be able to share very valuable information um, for our system. So I think that's going to really help us uh, quite a bit down the road as far as, um, you know, sharing information until we get one universal one. Are there any questions from the audience? Scott, do you have any questions on your end that you see? No, not at this time. Well, if that's the case, I would like to put a final plug in for the upcoming statewide uh, workforce development summit that is happening at the end of April in East Peoria. Um, there will be heavy content related to service integration at various levels and also um, accessibility and user friendliness of labor market information. So, uh, John, Todd, are you aware of any other particular um, uh, sessions at the summit that would be worthy of highlighting right now. I want to put you on the spot. Not on the planning committee. So. Um, stay tuned. <laughs> there'll be there'll be uh, a lot more. We're we're finishing and finalizing um, some some requests right now. So. Exactly. I mean, the the process now is that uh, final review of uh, presentation. Um, 
applications you know have have been are under the review process at this point. But you know, overarching you know the theme is you know service integration and 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 taking it to the next level. So innovative ways to be able to get there that are being shared by some different uh, elements. Exactly. Well, if there are no questions, uh, I'll turn it back over to Cameron and, and, and give my thanks to Todd and John for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Um, can everyone see the uh, information on the public comments and where to send those on their screen, uh, Scott? Yes, I can see okay. that now. Thank you. Um, so you have until February 9th uh, to send in your public comments. We encourage you to send those in uh, to that email on your screen on that first bullet point. Uh, you can also find the Unified State Plan draft, as, as I believe Mike mentioned, on the uh, WIOA uh, Illinois WorkNet uh, portal as well under the uh, resources uh, page. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we will uh, just have one more question for you uh, that we have, uh, which is uh, what role can you play uh, to facilitate uh, this, what we discussed over the next uh, four years, four years being the, the time frame of this uh, state strategy system? Uh, uh, state strategy uh, framework we have in the Unified uh, State Plan, uh, considering everything we touched on today, uh, what goals can you set for improving the workforce system yourself and, and through your uh, title and through, through your program as well? So that's just one question we want to leave leave with you today. Um, with that, that's all I have. Uh, do we have any other uh, questions that come in the time I've talked? Uh, no questions at this time. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending today. Uh, and uh, so thanks, thanks again.